Hi there, my name is FixFox, and welcome back to FixFox Shoutcasts. This is the series where you take the time to play F Heroes 2. You record that video, you send it to me, and then I get the chance to watch it, provide some insight, and ultimately I get to hype you up. Today is going to be a little bit of a different format than we usually do. This was a submission by Winnie Maru. He is a French YouTuber. He uh, does a lot of Heroes of Might and Magic 2 content, as well as some of these other types of games that some of which I really enjoy. Odd World, for example, is a blast from my childhood, and that's a game that he done a little bit that i enjoy but his heroes of might and magic 2 stuff very excellent very excellent i do believe that he is currently in the middle of a playthrough of the original campaigns i think he's currently on archibald as we speak but today will be the single player scenario pandemonium which is a very small map with a very electric fast start this video is going to come from his YouTube page. He has graciously offered to allow me to watch this video and to provide some comment and some feedback. And we're going to see how he handles some early game aggression and just go from there. So with that being said, folks, let's dive right in. So we start off with Winnie Maru talking about how he has just uh, tried and, and had a little bit of a mishap where he wanted to restart here in his scenario. As you can see, we currently have six heroes. We have pretty much one of each type of heroes, one necromancer, one wizard, one warlock, one sorceress, one knight, and one barbarian type of hero. And this is very, very nice as a start here for Pandemonium. In large part, I think, because you're able to choose which hero you want to be your primary hero. Of course, each and every hero has a little bit of a different speciality and skill progression, different chances of getting certain secondary skills. And so being able to choose which hero you want, it's nice to have that added flexibility. There's a lot less randomness to this scenario. As you can see though, we have many green heroes, many yellow heroes, and many blue heroes just outside. Now this video has been edited down a little bit to provide a little bit more of the shot by shot decision making that has happened here. And we can see that immediately Winnie Maru, he is heading into the fray he has consolidated a few of his troops and he's trying to put some of those uh, heroes out of the six to go and get some resources for him while a few heroes will probably be the likelier stronger heroes it's very reasonable to think that if you do not support your main castle you will lose it in short order we do pick up another hero as you can see we've picked up castor from that warlock castle very interesting if you can hold on to a warlock castle if you can effectively upgrade it if you can get two dragons you can be very very powerful we do have one stone lith immediately outside of our main castle gate there and it looks like one hero is going to go through the lith and that hero is going to be safe on the other side of the lith because in heroes of might and magic 2 unlike heroes of might and magic 3 if you are on the other side of the lith the enemy cannot come after you they uh, will get this little indication that there's something on the other side and they will be mm, boxed in they will be unable to go through that lith and fight you so otherwise we see it looks like oh my gosh it looks like we're going to try and mix things up just a little bit here uh, one hero is going to go down for the enemies there uh, and winnie maru is going to uh, ultimately lose a few heroes there goes one maximus goes down it looks like this blue knight does not have too big of an army but when you have only one peasant there's not much chance that you have not at all castor is going to go down it looks like this is going to be one of the blue barbarian heroes i'm imagining that the blue barbarians and the blue knights and the blue heroes in general that they're going to get a lot more experience than the green or the yellow heroes will otherwise i'm excited to see how many heroes we have left at the beginning of this because this is this is going to be an absolute bloodbath for a turn one there's an absolute bloodbath here we have a little bit of an interesting fight we have six halflings and three single stacks of boars it looks like uh, despite his best efforts winnie maru is not going to be able to make that fight go his way green is picking up a couple of good artifacts yellow is following suit right after and nobody has attempted to take his castle in large part that's because there is a hero with the bulk of the army in that castle it looks like it is currently rebecca who is in the castle we do have airy who still has a little bit of a fighting force and we are opting not to attack the yellow necromancer rialdo looks like we do understand about what kind of troops we might have to face we will see if he decides to fight them or not Ultimately, he does. And that's really not a bad idea. When you have multiple heroes, if you can defeat an enemy hero, you're going to get 500 base level experience just for defeating them. And so the experience you get from troops on top of that, good, good. But ultimately, not the the, the most amazing thing ever. Simply defeating one peasant with one enemy hero will provide you with a nice 
sum of experience. Looks like he is using his centaurs range effectively. It looks like he is using his sprites no retaliation ability very, very effectively. And it looks like after this fight's over, there's not going to be much left around us. It looks like the enemy's scattered. And I'm not sure if that was because of the strategy that Winnie Maru used. Was it strictly because he decided to combine forces and prevent the enemies from wanting to try and assault his castle? Or was it for some other reason that all the enemies scattered? Difficult to say, but I think it's safe to say that so long as you are able to hold your castle, so long as you have that foothold, you have a good likelihood of moving forward in this scenario. A couple of sprites go down, and I, I can't see a single other enemy hero currently on our screen here. The beachhead is clear. Looks like that's going to give us many opportunities to move forward. Oh, I guess that there is one more enemy here. This will be Ariel. I'm not sure if we're going to fight this fight or not. Ariel does have a few troops on her. 24 centaurs, though. It's going to make very light work of this enemy. It's going to come down to who gets to attack first. If those 17 sprites get the first hit on you, you're going to be feeling pretty bad. And it looks like due to the turn order, the 24 centaurs are going to get to go before the 13 sprites. Is Winnie Maru, is he going to allow the centaurs to take that major fight there? Or will he send the gargoyles across the battlefield, maybe take some damage from the dwarves? Tough to say. Tough to say what his plan is here. I think that we are seeing, though, a, a very purposeful decision-making process here from uh, Winnie Maru. He's He does a good job from the playthroughs that I've watched and I've enjoyed. Uh, since he, of course, is a French uh, streamer, YouTuber, I need to put the subtitles on. But when I watch him, I'm very impressed with, again, how purposeful he is in his decision-making process. And in fact, he probably saw what I failed to see there. And that would be that his centaurs, even though they were going to go for the big stack of six that he needed to attack that big stack because these single centaurs with no retaliation would not be able to clear out that one single sprite that came across the battlefield and did him some damage so i think that he probably already made that calculation uh, i don't have the subtitles turned on of course so it's a little bit difficult to figure out what his exact thought process is but very good use of the gargoyles to send them across and then another good use of your troops there with that one single sprite they're going to get in the way of those two dwarves i don't think that we were really in danger of losing a whole ton of those gargoyles from two dwarves and yet all the same we can consider that correct play so this battle we are continuing on very very quickly 21 centaurs six sprites left in the upper left corner the two dwarves i think that once you have your ranged creatures freed up you're going to do much better and then these griffins are going to finish off this fight and so we do actually save some troops so good use of his time good use of his energy a couple of interesting things that are around here we do have a fort nearby for the plus one to our defense we do have an observation tower we have several resources in the water behind our castle but i see no boat we're going to have to figure out what we do in order to get that boat so we can get into the water those resources are definitely going to be useful we see an oracle we haven't seen much by way of mines and the ability to replenish our resources and of course when we're playing as the warlocks resource management is very very key although with that being said warlocks do a very good job in the early game and here's how when you have your centaur cave which only costs gold you have your nest with your griffins that only costs 2000 gold and you have your crypt for your gargoyles that only costs gold and ore and so the first three levels of creatures are actually very inexpensive for the warlock faction and it provides you with one ranged creature and two flying creatures that is pretty darn good you compare that for example to say the first three creatures of the knight faction and you have the useless peasant you have the one archers that can turn into rangers and be useful and then the pikemen there's no question which creatures are going to do the very very best for you in clearing out the map having some tactical flexibility on the battlefield etc etc and so the warlock faction i'm not sure if winnie maru if he chose that on purpose or if he decided uh, not to uh, let the dice roll decide I'm, I'm not sure if the if it was random chance or not but ultimately that's the direction that we've gone here and i love the reaction there anytime you see the the basic eagle eye from a witch's hut you always say to yourself oh my is this really is this really what's come to if i need to rely on my basic eagle eye i think that we are in major major trouble we do pick up the advanced logistics there i don't know how seriously he's considering picking up rogues rogues can be a very good unit but you have to be very very tactical with them they will struggle to carry fights in the long run it looks like he's lost uh 
Aerie, who was uh, heading kind of to the west there, probably to clean up a whole ton of resources. This, this could be a very, very huge loss. If, if Aerie is able to get out ahead of this enemy hero, then you're able to pick up all these free re resources there. It looks like sulfur, it looks like crystal, uh, it looks like a couple of other things. And ultimately, that can uh, be a major loss if the enemy picks those up before you. Yep. We do see, by the way, on the western bank there, there's a boat being guarded by some royal mummies, and there is a Shrine of the Second Circle. If you could pick up a blind or a lightning bolt there in that Shrine of the Second Circle, that could be useful. If you can defeat the royal mummies, and if you can get into the boat, there is much treasure to be had behind you. Uh, not only the wood that you can get from the flotsam, but artifacts, uh, treasure chests giving you gold, very useful things there. Knowing that there's that alchemist lab to the east, I wonder if sorceresses would be more or less viable on this map as a particular choice. Uh, we will have to see if uh, we have much more trouble in finding sulfur for dragons and hydras here for Winnie Morrow. Uh, we got the plus one defense from the fort here. I'm thinking it looks like it's going to be more or less more or less it looks like it's going to be joe josh as the primary hero we don't have a mage guild and so rebecca's best ability having the additional knowledge kind of is a little bit of a waste there hard to use your knowledge to cast many spells if you don't have any spells at all to cast so joe josh i think as the primary hero is the best bet and we have uh, roxana there and the main castle she is more or less playing as a defender her abilities even as a, a little bit of extra defense can be very, very useful. And we come across a little cache of treasure there, plus five gems and a little bit of gold. Not too bad of a pickup. Uh, if you know about a map and you know about some of those intricacies, you can really plan your strategy around that. And so for a first time playthrough, those are sometimes a little bit frustrating because you didn't really know that you had an opportunity. And then you feel, dare I say, cheated by the lack of resources or lack of foreknowledge there we have uh more than 10 wood more than 10 ore we are missing plenty of sulfur we're missing a whole ton of these other resources like gems and things like that uh, besides the fact that we just picked up those gems so i'm excited to see are we going to go for more troops or are we going to try and go into magic again joe josh being the might based hero less likely that we see magic now we're picking up the waterfall so we have some additional centaurs a great pickup on day seven great pickup on day seven very interesting choice with the ballistics or with the estates and i do believe that he actually picked up the estates looks like looks like my editor uh missed that and so we're unable to see exactly which one that is by the way for those of you who are interested yes i am my own editor so the editor we can talk trash on that person all day long and no one will be the wiser i don't think he's gonna quit on me and if he does then um <laughs> we've got bigger issues so it uh, looks like we're gonna use some clever clever pathing we're gonna go back through the wishes hut on the beach we are losing a little bit of time because of course the beach terrain is uh, not ideal you, you do take a little bit of a penalty there and then otherwise again we've cleared this beachhead but we're not getting a lot of resources are we getting ahead what does the enemy have for us right now? There's much of this map that is currently unexplored. And other than the basic first and second level troops that we picked up from our initial starting six heroes, plus Castor, we don't really have much to our names. We have, again, picked up those additional centaurs, uh, an, an extra week's worth of growth, and we picked up those rogues. What's going to happen here? Looks like we are potentially on a collision course for those royal mummies. It looks like we have no enemies currently in sight. So perhaps we don't need to feel so threatened at the moment. A little bit of a hero trade. Looks like we're going to choose Roxana over Rebecca. And are we going to keep the skeletons out of that main army? Uh, it's tough to say. We're just doing a little bit of shuffling. And it's never a bad thing just to figure out the army, army compositions later. And there's still much to be explored here. Ah, I see we're getting the rogues into our primary army with joe josh excellent decision very interesting i like that we have uh, the way that winnie Maru is splitting up his troops he likes to have his centaurs at the very very bottom of the map now that means that his griffins are always going to go before his centaurs and there is also an interesting choice between having the big stack of gargoyles at the top above the single stack of gargoyles then the reason why that is always interesting is that hopefully that's a purposeful decision where you decide i do want to have my my big stack go first i want them to take the retaliation i want them to mix things up and then you have to decide where you put the flexibility of having that single stack sometimes uh, that 
decision making and sometimes that turn order can matter greatly so looks like we're going into an entirely defensive position i love this when you have multiple stacks of four royal mummies that's going to be five stacks of four to five royal mummies it's probably a good idea to let your centaurs carry this fight for you and not to mention those rogues are going to be very very effective they also like the sprites have no enemy retaliation and so if we can protect the rogues ah if we can draw away one full stack of the royal mummies then we can uh, save some damage we will see how this goes wherever these rogues go all of the mummies are going to go immediately after do you just take the hits and let your centaurs do the work or do you try and make good use of your no retaliation ability i think that that's exactly the choice that winnie maru has before him he's decided that he will take some damage it's gonna be two hits onto that big stack of rogues with the from the royal mummies 43 of those royal mummies do remain We've got a couple of stacks of five, four, and three, not to mention that big stack of five in the far corner, but an excellent job. That one gargoyle did an excellent job in assisting in making this fight go well. We talk a lot about isolating fights and trying to only fight when you have to, where you have to. Anytime you can get overwhelmed by the enemies and take all the hits at one moment, you're going to be feeling pretty bad, being, being feel pretty bad. He has found a way to slow the fights down, to spread the damage out over time, and in that way, he's able to focus on just a few of these troops one by one by one. So great use of his time. Those centaurs are not doing as much damage as I would have thought that they would have been doing. Royal mummies are a very excellent creature for the Necromancer faction as a tier three creature. They have a lot of hit points. They're pretty tanky. And because they have the curse ability, they do have the opportunity to prevent some damage onto their own troops if they can, but curse you. 34 rogues remain, by the way. And so... Uh, an excellent troop you should never underestimate the mummies whenever they come across your way do we kill the one single mummy or do we kill the big stack of three it looks like we're going to kill the one mummy here so the reason why these battles are always interesting to me is because it's always nice to see the way that people uh, manage their armies the way that they try and fight it looks like we're going to choose between advanced ballistics or the expert pathfinding we're going to go with the ballistics probably a good choice we haven't seen anything but a little bit of swamp to the south so not a bad choice at all but always interesting to see how people will manage their armies of course combat is one of the main theaters of heroes of might and magic so uh, we're looking to maybe pick up a sawmill and an ormai but we're also seeing some aggression we got sabu we've got a we've got some we've got some some okay barbarian troops coming but then we have charity immediately following fast behind and charity it looks like it's going to be a little bit of a, of a struggle hopefully we don't lose our castle we do have some defenders here it would have been very very nice to have had maybe uh, maximus the knight as one of the heroes that had remained behind because he does have the leadership ability mixing some of those ragtag forces uh, to pull together a nice defense that could have been very very useful uh, unfortunately maximus is long since passed and we do see in the upper left corner we do see genies now this could change our fortunes drastically i do hear the the little gasp from from uh, winnie Morrow. i think that he's completely correct in that because any number of genies can immediately change the fortunes of your fighting force and you can be so strong and he's saying ah i've made it into the water you're coming to chase me down and uh salutations off into the water i go good luck catching me ahoy there sailor <laughs> you, and, and so it looks like it's going to be roxana who is safe with her one single goblin and she's going to pick up all of those additional resources there so pretty thin margins when you have a small map you really have a lot of decisions that are going to matter very very much and any amount of skill that you can bring into those decision making processes that is going to go a long long way towards you either winning or losing so it's nice to see him uh, making some of those margins and going there this battle has been sped up uh, this is going to be a long time for these range creatures to shoot down these iron golems number one and number two it's going to be an awful lot of of just waiting for the enemy of course uh, all of these stacks of iron golems we've seen that the ai thinks that we're going to lose this fight in the auto combat and now winimaru is going to strategize how do i defeat this it looks like the golems are heading to the south are they going for the rogues or for that bottom stack of centaurs i'm guessing the centaurs 15 centaurs over the 14 centaurs maybe not it looks like actually the rogues are going to be the bait here 
rogues as the bait. There's some opportunities to use terrain to your advantage. But you don't want to lose those rogues if you can help it. Okay, staying safe for now, deciding not to spring the trap and just try and overwhelm our enemies. One iron golem is going down onto the gargoyles because we have the flying or excuse me, the centaurs. Uh, because the gargoyles and the griffins can fly, maybe we have the opportunity to cover up those centaurs we decide not to. It looks like that bottom stack of centaurs will be encumbered no matter what we do. Maybe we just leave them alone for now. But again, with some clever positioning, we've been able to do some damage, take out one full stack of the iron golems, and then a second. Centaurs are going to run rather than get a shot off. Five iron golems in the bottom there. What do you do with the gargoyles? Oh, nothing there, but we're going to allow the rogues to do damage where they can. And and there, running with the centaurs, a little bit of, a, of an interesting choice, because if you run, you don't get the damage off. But if you do run, then you force those iron golems, that big stack of five to make a decision. And now the, the battle is pretty straightforward because you decided to run. It sets you up for success in the long run. It's the difference between getting one single shot off now or getting multiple safe shots off later. Uh, minus five centaurs so pretty big losses but now four genies oh my word four genies sometimes you can get anywhere between one to four genies and if he'd gotten well if he'd gotten two genies that wouldn't have been nearly so good um but ultimately i'm very happy to see that it worked out well for him and four genies from there he's able i believe to move forward hopefully and repel some of these forces charity sabu and maybe explore a little bit more of the map, get some more of those resources. Again, we are lacking in a big way. He has picked up the ore mine. He has picked up the sawmill. So there's a lot of good stuff going on if he can just hold on. And again, on a small map with the enemy already having a decided advantage, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens next. So uh, this is ultimately a great case study and how you can fight some of these early scenarios. Uh, an excellent... Uh, look into what uh, Winnie Maru does to press his advantage and play to his strengths and his win conditions. I think that he prioritized a couple of things. First of all, I think he prioritized having his castle. He, he at no point was going to sacrifice that castle. And he did a lot of things just to either build up the castle so that its defenses would be stronger or to make sure that he had reasonable troops left behind. To retake your castle later is never a good decision here, but I think that he was very, very purposeful in how many troops he left behind and balancing aggression and adventuring while also maintaining what he already had. I think he did a great job of consolidating troops in the very beginning rather than having six heroes that were kind of strong with their troops. He decided to make sure that all the troops came together and then he had a few heroes try and get resources wherever they could and they went down pretty much immediately. Uh, heroes like Maximus, uh, heroes like, oh, there was the, the wizard hero that went down immediately. Anyway, you get what I'm saying. Um, I think that that was, a, that was a very purposeful and very, very good choice. And if you're interested in seeing how his first playthrough went without that additional knowledge, this was his second playthrough. You can find his first playthrough on YouTube and you can find the remainder of this playthrough where I do believe he drives this scenario home and wins. But I'm going to leave that for you. The important thing here is how can you win on these very small maps where every decision that you make is critically important to whether you win or lose. So good job, Winnie Morrow. I appreciate uh, him uh, offering and, and allowing me to do this Fixed Fox Shoutcast on this video. Go check him out. His information is going to be linked in the description of this video. And if you are interested in being featured on Fixed Fox Shoutcast, please, I would love to hear from you. That information is also in the description. You just gotta send me an email. You can record it and send it to YouTube. You can just record it on your computer and find a way to send me the upload of that, whatever works for you. I would love to see you in action. Folks, until next time, my name is Fix Fox. Take really good care of you, your friends, and your family, because if you don't, who will? And until next time, take real good care. And I'll see you around. Fix Fox out.